I had to, I've called this thing Flork forever, but I'm like, there's no yeah. way. That's too cool of a name. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to Linux Weekly. Daily Wednesdays where we sit back, relax, take that midweek break, talk about some of the fun things going on in the world of Linux and open source. I'm Vin Stone, joined every week by Joe Bryan. And of course, Chat Realm. We're just talking over in Twitch, talking over in Discord, doing those things. Uh, I was talking about the Rasta last week and yeah. i finally got a chance yesterday to plug that thing in. i'm not going to spoil anything because i have another project for interfacing linux to finish before i can even get to that but like a lot of you at home i have that problem with new stuff laying around the house you got to play around with it every now and then you're like i really want to just crack it open see if it works what can i do with it but i'm in this middle of this other project that's not going to stop me. I'm still going to give myself two hours to at least plug it in and play with it for a little bit. That's what I did yesterday. It's got a couple of problems, but it's got some very interesting things. And thanks, everybody, for leaving the feedback on the forum thread. A uh, couple of great ideas that I'll definitely be testing this week. Well, How about I you, Jill? I your screenshot um, oh, yeah. on X. Yeah. Your I got a little uh, Debian... <laughs> I'm like, hey, yeah. that was incredibly <laughs> boring. <laughs> there was there was it nothing was to it. I, I'm not going to <laughs> pretend like I plugged I plugged video into it. I put a thumb drive at it with a Debian and I cut it on. That was that was it. Then I went through a regular, ordinary Debian installation. It didn't blink. It didn't hang up. It didn't do anything crazy. And you know, like five minutes later, I was booted into XFCE desktop. I'm like, well. That's a nice. good thing. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's a good thing for like usability. It's probably a bad thing for like content of like, here's all the crazy stuff that you got to do to get it to work, you know, just, just cut it on. But I'll definitely be taking around in the bios. Uh, did you get more and more? Uh, did you look around the house the other day and you're like, yeah. you know what? I have a decided lack of plushies. I need to do something <laughs> I, about that. I needed another one. <laughs> it's so cute. <laughs> What what makes that one particularly special compared to the other ones outside of its hat? <laughs> it's got a little hat which has a little herring fish on it. All right, <laughs> it's really cute little embroidered herring fish. No, does it's just it another... uh, stick to walls? No, but it does uh, hang. I, okay. I didn't know it in, until I took it out of the package that you can hang it, which is great because I can hang it on. I have little hooks over here that I can hang it on. Okay. <laughs> It was just the pink one I didn't have yet. All right. <laughs> so I got it. <laughs> so cute. I love the shape. <laughs> like that. <laughs> it's adorbs. What do we got up this week? Well, ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to be talking about one of these. Well, not this exactly. You know what this is? This is that little um, smart soldering iron. You know, the one that predates the uh, pine soul. It's yeah. got the accelerometer in it. It's got an OLED display. And, you know, you touch it on things. It's a nice little heat stick. Not one that I use a lot. I've actually used this. I, I love when people show off their soldering irons and there's like no nothing on the tip. And I'm like, yes, what do you do? Like, just take that out of the box and take pictures. of. I use these things pretty regularly. So I was a little bit surprised. When I fix it, it's like, hey, man, we're getting into the soldering stick business. And I'm like, uh-oh, heat sticks for my hey. fix it. This could be interesting. This comes from Hackaday. Tom got a review unit. Now, you notice there's not just a heat stick in that picture. No, there's a power bank for that heat stick. Yes, that's a 100-watt smart iron. Kind of interesting take they did over at iFixit. They're using a 3.5 millimeters for your tips. So, you know, it's like a headphone jack plug which is pretty interesting. Now that block of business behind it is a 5,200 milliamp power brick. So you can do your heat sticking on the go. Pretty interesting. Now, why are we talking about this? You know, there's a soldering station. I got one kind of better than that. But anyway, it, let's, let's scroll down, take a look at it. And the one up top's kind of like the one I have. And the one at the bottom, you notice it might be missing something right out of the gate right there. You're like, where's the screen? How do I adjust it? More on that at 11. Configuring the iron is as simple as just like plugging it into your PC and opening Chrome because it uses mm -hmm. web serial. And that's all there is to it. And that's how you configure it. Uh, you can get a little app for it, but 
It's web serial, so you know you can fire up a TTY and log into it from the console. And yeah, you get all of your regular uh, commands that you would expect for your soldering iron. Now, I definitely had a moment the first time I updated the um, firmware on the soldering iron. I'm like, this is completely ridiculous. What am I doing? Updating firmware on a soldering iron. But there it is. It's all together. $79.95 for the iron and $249 for the iron with the brick combo. So here's my biggest problem with it. It is the lack of a screen. I went reading around, and I don't know if this is a common complaint or not, but I want to, I'm, I'm kind of spoiled by this, or if I'm using my bench iron, I know what my temperature is and I can readily adjust it because sometimes I'm working on surface mount components, but sometimes I'm doing through hole stuff and I need to jack that back and forwards or I need to dial it down ever so slightly because I didn't quite get the temperature right. And I want to be able to do that now. I'm spoiled with this guy. And that's one of the cool things it does is I can just tap, 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 tap. The I fix it. You're going to need to either have it plugged into that brick. So that kind of makes it a necessity instead of an optional accessory. And it, you know, the brick does have a screen on it where you can adjust temperatures and all that, or you're going to have to plug it into a laptop, open up Chrome, go to your iron and change your temperature adjustment. And that's kind of a, like, for what I use these things for, kind of a full stop. Like, no, can't use that. That's, that's too much because I don't want the power bank. You know, I'm like, the iron's pretty cool looking. I like the design of it. But yeah. not being able to change the, uh, adjust the temperature on the fly, where I could see that not being a problem with some people because, you know, in the olden days, you'd buy like a 35, 45 watt iron, you just plug it in, and that's what it was, and you lived with it. Those were called the dark ages. We don't do that anymore. Yeah. What do you think about it? And Joan, do you get any thoughts on the iFixit? I like the look yeah. of the iron. I like the brick. I like that it's portable. It's not crazy priced iFixit. It's got a great reputation for making quality stuff. This stuff is, uh, you know, not made out of, just the cheapest stuff possible. Like I always say that for I fix it and uh, 79 bucks for an iron isn't outrageous for a good iron at all. Yeah. I, I have a feeling probably in the next iteration, they'll probably put a little, uh, a screen on it for temps. If enough people, you know, want that I fix it is, is, is good about making adjustments like that. And I think this is a really brilliant move by iFixit, and it's a great addition to the iFixit universe because it just, it, it, it makes sense. I, with iFixit tools, you fix things. <laughs> so uh, like, you know, computers and, and tablets and everything in between with all their different uh, screw kits and whatnot. I've got several of them myself. And um, I think it's cool that the iFixit smart sol soldering iron is modular. It's easy to access and fully repairable, which you would expect from iFixit. And they will actually be providing full schematics, paired on guides, and spare parts as well. Yeah, I got a feel. I got a feel this might be a lot like the uh, iFixit toolkits, because I know a lot of people with iFixit toolkits, they're great toolkits, mm -hmm. but I know a lot of people that bought them. It's never opened them. They're just kind of like, just in case. You're like, hey, I got it. So they might buy it a soldering iron and be like, you never know, which is good because you never know. One day you might be bored enough and you're like, I'm going to learn to solder. Yeah. Oh, good job on that. Up next, everybody. <laughs> Kernel 6.11. Yeah. Out. It's got a couple of new tricks. It does. It sure does. So Linus Torvalds just released Linux Kernel 6.11 on Sunday with more awesome enablement for hardware, both current and future. For future hardware, the Linux kernel 6.11 supports upcoming AMD RDNA 4 GPUs. And this is cool. The AMD P-State driver now includes support for AMD Core Performance Boost, which gives more fine-grained control over turbo and boost frequency ranges. Oh, hang on. That's a kernel panic, isn't it? Oh, that, <laughs> yes, that's, it is. that is the. Oh, and that's the old tux kernel. It's <laughs> the QR code, uh, kernel panic. And this is the BSOD. It's, it's not blue. No, yeah. no, no, no. <laughs> that, that's dinosaur purple. That's the Barney screen at death. 
yeah, the, that that that's introduced in this version. The interesting things is none of the articles <laughs> mentioned it in the article. They just showed it on the picture and on the title. <laughs> so that was pretty funny. And uh, there's also initial support for laptops based on the Qualcomm Snapdragon X1 platform, including from Asus and Lenovo. And Linux kernel 6.11 enables memory hot plugging for Risk V. That's pretty cool. Also. The MediaTek-based HP Chromebook X3 360-13 and Acer Chromebook 311 are now supported. And something I am really, really excited about is that the Linux kernel 6.11 will be included in the Ubuntu 24.04 LTS early next year. Oh, yeah, there it is. Ven just brought, brought a, a oh, picture of it. Oh, 499.99 of it. How many do we yes. need? Oh, dude, we need to get, what, like seven? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Boeing, yeah, I don't know, man. Yeah, the uh, Boeing one. I, yeah, I, might might not be the best uh, name to have on your product these days, but <laughs> five hundred bucks, man. People get crazy with their flight sim stuff, though. Oh yeah, oh yeah. Bunch of cool stuff to play around with in Kernel six eleven, and I'm on Debian twelve. So instead of waiting for uh, twenty four oh four, I'll just build it myself and try it out. Yeah, there yeah. you go. But I'm not going to buy a five hundred dollar flying yoke. Uh, yeah. <laughs> People, you can get a private lesson for us in that. <laughs> Trust me on it. <laughs> Firefox, Mozilla. We talked about them. Uh, yes. I find that more and more we're talking about Firefox and actually more about Mozilla doing Mozilla type stuff, man. Mozilla Corporation. Like, what are you guys doing? Why are you putting AI chatbots in our browser? It's crazy. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I thought it might be time to remind everybody about something that's not called Florp. Yes. Despite, <laughs> despite it being spelled F-L-O-O-R-P. Because I had to look this up. I had to, I've called this thing Florp forever, but I'm like, there's no yeah. way. That's too cool of a name. And uh, <laughs> I, I found the kanji characters for it and somebody broke it. It's enunciated Flop. <laughs> yes, that makes sense. And more importantly for our video viewers, their website does this. That's a cool effect. Very 3D where you can kind of wiggle it around. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That is cool. Pretty neat. I'm down with it. So what is it? You never heard about it? It's Firefox, but from Japan. It is. It, think about it in like relation to Firefox is the same of like Vivaldi is to Chrome, you know? It's got mm -hmm. a bunch of, you know, that, that same base but a bunch of really cool things added to it. Like with Flope, you get dual sidebars, five interface designs, and not just one. You can completely change things around. No tracking, and of course they do regular updates. And it's built by a team of four people who are currently either in university or secondary school, man. Like a bunch of young kids throwing this together, and I love to see nice. stuff like that. And most of Flope's features are native, so... Unlike uh, add-ons, they're not going to slow the browser down. You know, this thing's got vertical tabs, completely native, and it's got sidebar, multitasking and all that. It's got sleeping tabs, so go to bed mm -hmm. when they're not doing anything. And of course, they got a GitHub project. I just wanted to give them a shout out. Download it and go try it. Um, because, you know, if you don't know, there's a bunch of Firefox-like you know, they have like souls like, right? You know, this is the new souls like. Well, this is Firefox like. And Chrome's had this for a long time too. You know, you got Vivaldi, Brave, IE. Mm -hmm. well, you know, you got Waterfox, Fox Fox, Ham Fox, whatever. Go <laughs> try Flope. Give it yeah. a spin. See if you like it. I, I love how customizable it is. It's, it's a lot like that was a good uh, comparison. It is a lot like Vivaldi, but uh, for. Firefox. And the uh, Flope web browser is actually based on Firefox's extended support release. And Garuda Linux's security conscious and pretty cyberpunk themed Fire Dragon web browser is a fork of Flope and is one of my favorite web browsers that I use frequently. So I was happy we were giving this web browser some love because lots of good has come from it. Let's close out with a Raspberry Pi. Goodness, uh, some fresh QT. Oh, it's yeah. moving to QT6. About time. Yeah, about time. So 
One of my favorite pieces of software for flashing ISO, IMG files, etc., to USB drives and SD cards just got a big update. The Raspberry Pi Imager 1.9 cross platform image writing tool was just released, and it now uses, yes, the QT6 framework. This QT6 upgrade makes it more stable, and it has an upgraded user interface with more modern rounded buttons. But my favorite change is that it is now more portable. The Raspberry Pi Imager 1.9 is now available as a handy app image for Linux. Yay! One of the things I'm like looking at right here on the download page is like they have, uh, of course, x86-64 and one for ART-64, you know, um, ARM. That's great, but that's also part of the problem. At least on my end, you know, because here's what I really want to see. I tried it. I downloaded the app image, chmod. You know, but I didn't even chmod it. I was busy. I like right clicked and went in to like allow executable in Thunar. Getting old. One thing I see that just bugs me a little bit, just a little bit. This is not like a major issue. This is not a showstopper. Is when you go to the Raspberry Pi imager, right? Let's uh, take a look. You basically have three options. What's your Raspberry Pi device, your operating system, and your storage? Easy enough to set up. You pick your device, but when you get to the operating system, you're presented with your primary options, and they're all desktop, full desktop images for Raspberry Pi. I want the light version. That's what they call that. You have to go to Choose OS, then you got to go to Raspberry Pi OS Other, as they called it, then to Raspberry Pi OS Light. Multiple steps to get to that. And I find that very strange, especially when my option one is a Raspberry Pi Zero. You're not running a desktop on that. You're not. You know I'm going for uh, light. Let's not call it light anymore. Let's call it what it is, headless. I think that's a good idea. That'd be very, very usable. And since we're just doing little wish dreams mm. for old man Ben, how about this? Now, they finally added the option to allow you to configure SSH, right? Mm -hmm. Which is wonderful. I love being able to pre-configure my SSH and have that ready to go before I burn the image. Give me an option to set a static IP address. That is maddening. <laughs> because <laughs> in the studio, there is no DHCP. And that is on purpose. And in a lot of professional environments, that's also a thing that's set up for security reasons, and I'm not going to get in a slap fight with you. You either know about that or you don't. You don't want things auto-configuring to your network. But I can plug it into the router. It's like this runaround thing I have to do where I have to like get the cable out and plug it into the router, cut on that port in the router, go into Winbox and find what DHCP IP address it is assigned to it, write that down, then I can SSH into it, and da 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 I'd love that option just to be like, just give me an IP, let me do a net, subnet, and uh, default gateway. Golden. I'd be so happy. And there I think a go. lot of people would too. And it makes like yeah. quadruple sense, especially when you're doing um, like smaller things too. Yeah. Hey, there. there's a great tip for the Raspberry Pi Imager 2.0. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Outside of that, no, it's fantastic. Uh, the Raspberry Pi Imager, that's like the thing to mm -hmm. use. If you're using yeah. something else, give this a try. I mean, it automatically downloads the images. Like you select the ones and it'll keep them cached for you. That's great. I've been using it. I'm working on a Raspberry Pi project right now. So I'm kind of deep in the Raspberry Pi ecosystem. Yeah. And uh, yeah, that'd be great to see. Good to see it's an app image. Double click on it. You know, it's like a flat pack without having to install an entire thing to install the thing. Yes. <laughs> yeah, you just double click on it and it works. It's great to see. Yeah. Yay. That's going to wrap us up. Yay. See, I'm not going to say how long we've been recording because that confuses people. Oh, yeah. <laughs> it's been 26 minutes. But go back and watch the uncut version of the show if you want the entire live experience because it's usually about an hour, hour and 10, hour and sometimes yeah. longer than that to get through one of these. And if you want to know about how to get your Linux love and myths on that. Head over to the support tab on linuxemcast.com. Become one of our gorgeous, beautiful party patrons. 
Then you get your own custom RSS feed with 11 uncut versions of the shows, along with the pre-pre super shows and, and a bunch of other things we like to throw in. And of course, we have LibrePay, PayPal, and all that. All those come with, um, well, at least uh, Twitch subs and Patreon access to our super secret Discord that were in the other six days of the week. Bunch of fun things going on in that. Come play Track Media with me on Tuesdays and Fridays. we got a great people. That thing, um, you might want to get your skills together because that might very short, not short. Oh, how many more days are left in this one? Uh, probably in about two weeks is going to become waiting room only for reasons. And that's mm-hmm. all I'm going to say about that. Spoilers, but you might be able to put two and 13 together if you want to peruse the forums over at interfacinglinux.com because that's where it's going to show up. But it's time mm-hmm. to cut on the yeah. music and roll some credits for the people who make this show. Possible. And thank all our beautiful patrons, including our advisors like our Theron in chat, our executive producers 12345, Ian Eship, Hair Ducky, our Chicago Kicks Bottom, <laughs> Turbos, <laughs> Choice Love, <laughs> our Sea Monsters, uh, Vera Tenuta, <laughs> our Death Notes, uh, Leonardo, Martin, Nubbin, Chad, Zeno, our Chairlings. Uh, Mir PPC, Steve, David, <laughs> too many of you to name, all, all you beautiful patrons. <laughs> Thank you so much. <laughs> you're awesome, but you already knew that. We'll see you <laughs> next week, everybody. Yeah. Bye-bye. Bye, everyone. <laughs>